Hey guys, welcome to this week's podcast episode. I've got a really fantastic guest, really niching down, talking about brand, how to build a brand. His name is Stephen Frey, and he's got a really unique approach, and I'm going to let him talk about it because he can talk about it better in, in his own words. So, uh, Stephen, welcome. Thanks. Thanks, Christopher, for having me, and thanks, listeners, for joining us today on uh, the Financial Freedom Podcast. Thank you. Yeah, I know we were backstage, and you, you. Uh, what's interesting is you have a lot of interesting words. You, you, you have your adorable brand scientist next door, ready to help your brand be a success. You also talk about some interesting concepts. So, kind of expand upon that and how you got started and what you do for clients. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, when I often when I describe myself when I'm on stage or introduce, I say that I'm the adorable founder and chief brand scientist at Quantum Branding. And I say that because there's something about science that just is really fun and evokes just this explorative wonder. And adorable is the best word to describe uh, that for me. And what uh, hanging out with me is like, it's geeky and nerdy, but it's also fun and cute all at the same time. Uh, there may be an orange cat that hovers around me on this call. I don't know. Uh, so if you like cats and you like the color orange and you like science, hang out with me. And so, yeah, um, I help brands become authentic and memorable category leaders uh, through the power of brand science. Um, and that is what I've identified is the core of what uh, helps fuel a successful brand's growth sales and marketing. And so I really love to help explain uh, that through lighthearted and articulate insights uh, and make it easy to understand um, how branding is the most important aspect of every brand's existence. So uh, hopefully we can talk a little bit more about that today. And you, uh, the listeners, can walk away with some actionable steps uh, to find out how you can uh, get help with right where you are and move yourself forward faster. So that's, uh, I think, what we're going to be talking about today. I don't know. Yeah. So you have an interesting, you've coined the term brand science as the core of successful branding and kind of elaborate on what brand science is and how it differentiates from traditional approaches. Sure, sure. So um, most people are familiar with the terms marketing. They're familiar with the terms branding. What I'd like to do is I'd like to take a very functional approach and say, what is what is marketing? And if we look at marketing that says, you know, don't re remove the technology or the modality for a second, what is it doing? And it's literally doing, hey, do business with me. <laughs> you know, that's really what marketing is doing. So any of the marketing that you're doing and then advertising, it's just marketing that's paid. You paid for someone else to do that for you. So you're paying someone else to say, hey, do business with them. You know, uh, so marketing is, hey, do business with me. And then branding are the distinctive elements that we experience from a sensory perspective. Sight, sound, touch, feel, story, word, shape, color, uh, music. Uh, there's, there's several categories, but how we make memories is based on our senses. Literally, our brain is trying to make sense of the world around us. And we've even learned that uh, some people are wired differently and they're neurodiverse. And so they may even be, experience them differently. But regardless, everybody is making sense of the world around them and making memories based on their experiences from their senses. So if we integrate those memories, how do we do that? With branding. So branding is the, the set of mnemonic or memory devices that we are creating within their category and for their brand to help make people think of you and your brand first. Yeah, I love that. And it's all uh, what I love it. It's science. So you know, there's tried and true principles. Um, there's a great book by Robert Cialdini called Influence, which kind of you can study brands and marketing and messages and you can see each one of those components in their messaging. The next next question is um, branding myths and conceptions. And you have what are some of the most common myths or conceptions about branding and marketing that businesses fall prey to? And how does your approach help in dispelling these myths? Absolutely. So most times we when we're we are starting our business, we say, ah, I need a brand. And then you're like, well, I'm going to create a brand. And here's here's the thing. 
it's not about who created it. It could be your nephew. It could be someone from church. It could be someone on Fiverr. It could be an agency. But there's typically this initial creation stage. And that's great. That's great. I'm so proud of you for having a brand and going through at least those first steps. That's really, really important. What brand science does and says, you know what? Um, that's great. And we want to continue to create memories. Uh, and here's the common misconception. Most people think their brand is the logo or their brand is is most of the work is done by the logo. Like I, I, if people see my logo, they're going to know who I am. And that may be true. But here's the interesting thing. When you look at Fortune 500 brands, such as Coca-Cola, they have over 150 sensory brand assets of word, shape, color, story, sound, music, and character. They've got always Coca-Cola. They've got the shape of the bottle. They have the swooshy, you know, of the brand mark itself. They have the motion graphics of how that unravels. They even have the polar bears and Santa Claus at Christmas. I think they even introduced a, a penguin. <laughs> then you have the archetype of the stories they're using of the every man, every day, you know, they have the use of iconography that they're using, the color palettes of the products. At the end of the day, they have over 150 and counting. And if you wanted to go start a, a Coca-Cola brand uh, or a cola brand, you would have a very difficult time competing. You'd have to start on a local level first to get validation distribution. But here's the thing. It's not just about creating a cola company, any company, cannot compete with Fortune 500 brand science when it comes down to the sensory assets. So you may have a brand mark, your brand, the name. So you've got the brand mark, your name itself, and then maybe a color you use. If your competitor or other folks in your industries who may not even, you may not even feel like are your competitors, if they have 10 to 15 sensory assets, maybe they have a color palette. Maybe they have a really distinctive set of typefaces they use. Maybe they also have a tagline. And when we start to add these up, um, when we start to add these up, we find that this uh, distinctive brand asset palette, it's just like Bob Ross. Like, you know, you have a palette, like those little like circle shapes with paints on them. It's just like that. And oh, every time you create a campaign or a new thing, you want to grab, oh, here's our color. Here's our brand mark. Here's our photography. And these are assets that are distinct to you. If you only have three of them, you're going to have a really hard time getting traction in your industry. And here's why. Because the number one way to be top of mind in people's minds and to have mental availability is by having distinctive brand assets. So you may have done that a long time ago, but if you're not actively investing in creating more and refining those ones constantly and consistently, your brand's going to be dull, it's going to be forgotten, and you simply just don't have, it's almost like not having enough gas to go up a hill, like or enough traction to go up a hill. You you need enough traction to propel your mind, your brand in the mind of people every day. And so brand science teaches us about distinctive brand assets. It also distinct, uh, teaches us about um, how to even create the optimized message structure for campaigns. So it gives us a way to cut through the fluff, make our marketing simpler, and make sure that we're top of mind with the right tools. Yeah. And what's interesting is when you're describing Coca-Cola, I mean, you can hear the, like, when you think of the brand Coca-Cola or like brand Starbucks, like, McDonald's, you like you get this sensory feeling. It's kind of like when you're asked to recall it, it's like, you know, you it's like this, it's like these emo. Yeah. And like talking about brand impact measurement, how can businesses effectively measure the impact of their branding efforts and what metrics or indicators that are central to your methodology? Cause you know, you know, like smell and taste and touch, how do you quantify that? Sure. Sure. So so what we find is like some of the assets, uh, some of the things like when it gets into the product, uh, that's going to connect with experiential qualitative things. Like people are going to review your product. Oh, this is the orange cream sickliest flavored candy I've ever had in my life. Five stars. It's great. So you're going to get some of those qualitative feedback, which is important to create a feedback loop for the customer experience. But when we're talking about launching your brand, we have to go back to exactly how are we doing that and how are we creating those memories? Because we may we don't want to actually get into just yet um, the experience. Like we need to think that out 
But initially, we need to have the assets because that's what they're going to utilize before they purchase. So they're going to have heard of you. A friend of you of, is yours is going to tell you about it. You're going to see an ad online. You're going to get coupons sent in the mail. If you hear about Chobani yogurt, Chobani yogurt, Chobani yogurt, you see commercials on TV, there's ads, it's following you on Facebook, and then you get to the grocery store, there's no Chobani yogurt, they have failed. So <laughs> mental availability and physical availability are the two best friends in brand science. And yeah. so mostly what I'm, I'm not getting into distribution, although that's a valid part of metrics. Over here, we're looking at your brand assets. And so I actually have a tool and this is uh, the same tool that Mars Pet Care, um, Coca-Cola, um, uh, Walmart, Target, Michaels, um, any large brand that's using, using Fortune 500 brand science, they're using the same methodology of counting their brand assets. They're looking at how many assets. And so I have a tool, it's called the brand science checklist. Um, and you can check it out. It's bit bit.ly brand science checklist. It'll be in the, in the show notes too, but this is really the starting point. You want to see how many do you have? How many are you starting with? And at the end of the day, uh, your brand should have at least 15 to 25 to start. Hmm. And, uh, in, in the, the, that checklist, we'll walk through and say like, okay, uh, do you have a brand mark? Do you have a colorized version of that brand mark? Do you have a color palette? Do you have specific colorized colors that you use for your products that would be, you know, noticeable? Um, uh, do you have typefaces? And so when when we're working through this checklist, we're we're going through each category. And basically you want two or three here, two or three here, two or three here. And the goal is then we we identify which one of these are worth investing in. And and we, we need to ask ourselves, when people see this color. Does it remind them of a category? You know, so when you see Pepto Bismol pink, does it remind you of Pepto Bismol, or does it remind you? Oh no, no, that's Barbie pink. So, so sometimes there's a color that may be used in multiple categories, but if customers see it in your category, they understand what it is. Uh, we know that yellow may mean lemon um, if we're talking about fruit flavors. But we know that yellow may mean stained teeth if we're talking about the dental industry. So color theory is not universal. It's cultural and it's contextual. And the goal is to first sit down and count how many assets we have and then ask ourselves, do these make us think of a category? Do these make us think of our competitor? And can I uniquely use them and people associate them with me? And those are really, that's the first starting point is doing the brand assets checklist and asking those three questions about the category, the competitor, and if, if they are distinct to, to me. And the goal is for you to have the most famous and distinct assets that represent you. So that way you truly are distinct and people remember you. Yeah, I love that. Um, kind of rounded out with um, just kind of uh, some success stories, brand science in action, and how can people find you and follow you? Absolutely. Absolutely. So we're going to put some links in the show notes. Um, I have a link tree uh, that you can click on and you can check out the brand science checklist uh, as well as uh, find out more about the Brandpreneur program. That's a 10 week uh, program to help you understand the foundations of brand science um, and walk away with a brand plan. So you may be feeling stuck and worried that you don't know how to implement some of these things on your own. And so when you're going to service providers, you don't know what to ask for. This is going to get rid of that and help you understand how to move confidently in your brand's future. Um, and, and to round this out with a success story, um, whenever I work with brands, uh, what's interesting is the brand science is the same. Um, I've worked with over 150 major brands in 65 different categories. And what's always the same is people. And people always have minds and those minds for the most part work the same. And so, um, there was, there was an author uh, and she was also, um, she just finished her PhD. She was doing some speaking. She was the leading practitioner in her field. And so one of the things we did is came up with a brand identity that was distinct within her category, but yet felt native. Like if you're in the cookie aisle, You've got to be a cookie. You can't be a chip or a cracker, or a cake or pie. You got to be a cookie. And so using some of the shared memory structures, we helped create a brand identity for her that felt intuitive, felt like she was, you know, a senior level expert in her field. And it's what she used to help propel um, her coaching, 
um, for her leading uh, psychology program for practitioners, as well as be the framework for her book and for her events that she's creating too. And so all of that started with her saying, I want people when they see my brand to intuitively understand how it, how I provide what I do, who I am, what I do, and why it matters. And so uh, using the science of how brands actually work, we're helped helped her able to to create that brand to help her get uh, not just traction, but success in her field. Okay. And for all the audience out there, let's thank Stephen for coming on and talking about brand science and follow him on all of his social media links. Those will be in the research in the show notes. And that thanks so much for coming on to the podcast. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. And thanks so much for listening to